All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. I imagine other people are going to drop in as as we um, as we get going. It's wonderful to see names and faces of people I know, and I love. I'm so happy. To be um, so my name is Samat Abdurraqib. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And this event, this event is a kickoff of the Maine Humanities Council and the Maine State Library's 2021 Poetry Express program. Um, the five Poetry Express events this year. So we've got one happening Friday, May 21st on Instagram Live with The Telling Room. And coming later on this summer and fall, we've got, we've got, um, the Auckland Public Library, with Elder Abuse Institute of Maine, with resources for organizing and social change, and with Women's Veterans of Maine. So please um, keep your eyes on um, the Maine Humanities Council's website and social media to find out about those upcoming events. Um, a couple of things before we jump in. So some suggestions. We suggest that you stay in speaker view. And if you're in speaker view, then right now you're just gonna be looking at the, um, how many of us are there? The nine of us, the nine poets who are gonna be reading um, tonight. Our videos are spot um, are spotlighted or spot lit. And so we suggest that you stay in speaker view. If you're not sure how to do that, you can go up to the, to the right-hand corner of the black Zoom area and you can click on view and there will be two options, speaker or gallery or full screen. You can make us full screen, but please um, uh, make sure that you're in speaker view. That is our suggestion to you so that when we are reading and speaking, you can see us. Um, if you have any questions, please drop them into the chat box. You can drop them. We'll have a, a moment for a Q&A at the end, but you can drop them at any point in time as we are reading and talking. If you have any gratitudes, any praises, if you want to like, you know, um, um, type out emojis and praise dancing, you can do that. You can also do that in the chat if you are so inspired and you will be inspired because we are wonderful and magnificent. You will be inspired. So please put it in the chat. Um, and finally, Kyle from the Humanities, Maine Humanities Council will be pulling questions from the Facebook Live feed and we'll be dropping them into the chat. And so it might look like Kyle is asking a series of questions. It's really, she's just pulling them from the Facebook Live feed and dropping them into the chat. So, um, and please, again, if you can keep yourself on mute and I'm gonna pass it off to Lala. Thank you so much. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is not only the kickoff event for Poetry Express. It, this is a year, this month, that this group has been meeting together, sharing poetry, um, working with each other, holding, growing. Um, I can say personally that I've grown so much by, by sharing words and poetry with this amazing group of poet friend humans. And I am just absurdly honored that we all keep showing up, you know, and supporting each other and loving each other and being really vulnerable and raw and authentic with each other and going places that it's honestly astounding that we go with each other. <laughs> you know, you can be in community with people. Um, and, and then once you you start sharing words, it's it's really powerful. So I have the honor of introducing all of us. Um, so first up is Kate Vaughn, pronouns she, her. Kate is an organizer, birth companion, and childbirth educator living in the coastal city known as Portland on unceded land of the Wabanaki Confederacy. Kate was forever changed by Audre Lorde's concept that poetry is not a luxury and experiences this crew of poet friends forged in the fires of a pandemic to be necessary medicine for her living. <sighs> Jan Vindis Tenney, pronouns they them, is a queer and trans writer, reader, fighter, lover, friend, and parent. They work at Maine Humanities Council where they curate a weekly poetry feature on WERU community radio called Poetry Express. 
Jen Carter, she, her, is androgynous, shy, queer, crazy, a lover of nature and books, a mom, a survivor, and an educator. She writes poems about all of these things and is very grateful to be part of this sweet, brilliant group of poet friends. Lala, they, them. <laughs> experiences life as a Black, queer, non-binary, transracial adoptee. They are a poetic joy seeker, word weaver, organizer, activist, and healer. They live and love on unceded Abenaki territory where they exist with their pit bull, Eli. They also are a facilitator and speaker with the Maine Humanities Council. Maya Williams, a they, she, is a mixed, is a Black mixed race poet based in Portland, Maine. A has published poems in venues such as Littoral Books, the Portland Press Herald, Freeze Ray, Homology Lit, and more. They have also performed at venues such as the Kennedy Center's Arts Across America series, the Mixed Remix Festival, Black Table Arts, and more. She is so excited to share space with these incredible humans and their words. Miri. She, her, they, them is a Black artist and healer who loves the energy and creative expression of poetry. Traveling from Karankwa land in the South Texas region, Miri has been living in Wabanaki, Abenaki land for a little over three years and is excited to be part of more artistic adventures in the Maine community. Zamara so Durkee, she, her is. <laughs> Blackity Black Black, queer Muslim writer and bird enthusiast who's been living and loving in Wabanaki Abenaki land for 10 years now. Black queer writers raised her and taught her and she is forever grateful for that. Sma works at the Maine Humanities Council with a lovely group of word nerds. Samara Koldoyan, she, hers, is a children's book author, poet, and educator, deeply proud of her Haitian roots and, complete, and deeply in awe of the landscape of unceded Wabanaki territory on which she was raised and still resides. She works for Maine Writers and Publishers Alliance as a part-time organizer. And Sass Linekin, they, them, is a community organizer, grandparent, <laughs> and late blooming non-binary queer with uh, propensity for long-windedness and laughter. Sass lives in central Maine where they've spent their time during the isolation of the pandemic feeling grateful about finding deeper connection through this group of poetic word magicians and pondering what to do with the feelings that come from being an empty nester just be after beginning to earn a living wage for the first time in their life. <sighs> Wow, I am I'm so, 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 so honored to be here with everybody. And now I get to pass it back to you, Samantha. <laughs> Thanks, La. Um, yes, as I said, and I will probably say over and over again, I'm just so thrilled to be here with you all. Um, as La said, that this is a this is a um, a group we've been writing together for a little over a year now. Um, some of us have um, performed collaboratively together, and so this. Um, this Poetry Express, this project that we are doing on today is all about vulnerability and connection. Um, um, as Lala said, we came to we came together at the beginning of the pandemic and we were trying to fight isolation and and um, Lala, I think, was like, let's write together for National Poetry Month. And so that is what we did. Um, and so tonight we will share um, poems. Um, uh, that we've written collaboratively, and it will look like this. Um, each of us has written a poem, and we will read that poem. Um, and each of us has taken that poem that we wrote and has have given it to someone else in the group, and they've written a poem in response to to that, uh, you know, to our poem that we gave them. And so we're gonna um, we're gonna go around like that in the order that we shared our poem. So Samara is gonna start. And then Kate is going to read her response to Samara's poem. And then Kate's going to read her original poem. And then Maya will read their response to Kate's poem and so on and so forth. And then at the end, um, and then after that, we'll take a break and we'll just say, hey, we're amazing, right? And then um, we will share a poem that we wrote collaboratively where we um, 
I don't know what, I don't remember what it's called, but you know, there are lots of ways that you can write poems collaboratively, but we kind of uh, lines and then, and then we saw the, you know, we saw the two lines that came before, or, and then we just wrote two lines. And so we're just, we'll share that collaborative poem. I am concerned because now I don't see, hey, but um, so first up are Samara and Kate, and it might just take a, a second because we have our tech person who was doing all the unspotlighting and spotlighting. So just be patient with us as we, um, as we get the right people on the screen. So, um, Liz, I think Kate needs to be a co-host again. And it's, it's the Brady Bunch. And it's Samara and Kate. Okay, thank you so much. It's so exciting to be here. I, oh, I'm unmuted, right? It looks like I'm un unmuted, but I'm getting this message that I need to unmute myself. So I'm so confused about that. Okay, um, so I wrote this poem for my son Cohen. Um, I might be, I, I could start crying right now and just continue crying throughout the evening, it's fine. Um, but this is Autism Awareness Month and my son is on the autism spectrum. And so I wrote this poem about um, just me seeing him for who he is, um, just the unique person that he is and how it feels just to see him and love him. Um, so that's it, I'm very emotional about this. I'm gonna shake a little bit, but thank you for, for sharing this space with me as I share this really important poem with you. It is called, My Boy. Your body bends in ways that look uncomfortable to me. This is how you rest. You speak in words I don't understand looking into my eyes, laughing. I smile back, reaching for you, and you evade my touch, still giggling, still speaking. Okay, I say, still smiling. My throat squeezing, my chest expanding until my boy, I say, I love you. Thank you, Samara. So I'm Kate, um, and I had the absolute honor of writing a response piece to what Samara just read. Um, and I, I loved that poem. I love it because um, it's so honest and just straight, just like this straightforward, just love and that wanting and all of those things. And, um, I think about birth a lot. <laughs> um, I've been doing a lot of thinking about parenting and motherhood and birth. And so I felt like this poem was such a great gift. Um, and so I'm going to read what I wrote in response. Um, my piece is called Unsetting Sun. I made you of myself and lend you out to the world for growing from necessity. And yet there is a hollow here that I carry fitted to your shape, the curve of your spine only, the resonance of your laughter alone. Boys grow into strangers who speak in the language foreign from their mother tongue, the one I spoke to you through womb water and the hallowed architecture of my center. 
built to carry and release you in turns. Boy, you grow up and on. Boy, you are a part of me even when apart. Boy, you are forever known to me and unknowable still. This mother love is a sun who never sets on you, clear and lit up sky, open and infinitely stretching. Just look up, boy of my bones, my boy. Thank you. Right, I have to read again. <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> give me a minute to try to uh, shift gears. I'm just like watching Samara and just sending you so much love. So, Ooh, love all you, right. Samara, so, so much. Yes. So, so. I love what sharing our poems with each other like opens in us and what it makes possible. It's really beautiful. So, um, Okay, <laughs> this is another poem about birth and stuff like that. So um, I wrote this poem after uh, serving as a birth companion for someone who had a really rough birth. <clears throat> um, and this poem is called Comfort Measure. Kneeling on the hospital bed, your thin and weary frame poised on the edge. I tried to work my thumbs and fingers between the muscles knotted close and tight. You let me press deep, press as deep as I could, saying it hurts good. You know about hurt and less about good, or so the nurses suspect and assume. They bruise your veins, no attempts to be gentle with you, who laid flat as a surgeon lifted your fourth baby from the wreckage of a womb they treated like nothing. As if she was born from nowhere, instead of cradled safely in your impossibly strong body. You who sang to her, who hung butterflies on every wall of the makeshift nursery. You who know nothing about giving up, who cannot sit still, except when I ask if I can try to work out the knots braided across your back. You sit at the edge and you say yes. I love you, Kate. Thank you so much for your piece. Cause like you. it had to take me a bit to write a response to it. Cause like the immediate things that stood out to me was like how often people with uteruses are treated as disposable. And as well as like, like being someone like who work, who works a lot and talks a lot about, a lot about consent. Um, like we often hear like, no is a complete sentence, but like, and then after reading your poem, it's like, wait a second, but yes is a complete sentence too. Um, so it just, I just wanna thank you so much for that poem and thank you for your feedback about my response uh, poem as well. <sighs> you are not the disposable trash, the wasteful ones in white coats think you are. You are the beloved portrait well-framed in your loved one's living room. The prized antique vase upon the highest top shelf behind glass cabinet doors. The generational necklace your children will refuse to take off. You are not a burden who deserves death. Your life and your generosity of life is a gift. No is a complete sentence, but so is yes. Yes, you are more than enough. Yes, you are beautiful beyond the surface. Yes, you are loved. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. So this poem um, I chose for Jan to respond to because like, because I know how wonderful of a writer Jan is. And also like I wanted 
give Dan the opportunity to like pop off for lack of better words. Um, because as someone who is a huge film nerd and writes a lot about films and has working a lot more towards essays and facilitating interviews about films, um, I wrote a whole poem about like a common critique in action movies around around like, why, why do the women always wear heels? It doesn't make any sense. Um, and granted, there's some validity in, in the critique because most of those movies are made by men, but at the same time, this is another thought that came to mind. In defense of women wearing high heels in action movies, maybe she wants to feel as tall as the men she fights. Maybe she wants to look good to feel good while kicking someone's ass. Maybe she wants balanced posture as she stops over to defuse a bomb someone put in another expensive ass building. Maybe she wants blisters and scars on her heels and toes to build her stamina because sneakers are fucking boring. Maybe she doesn't care how they slow down how she runs because it increases how she sloops and stealths. Maybe she doesn't care whether it appears realistic or not because that is what helps mess with the enemy's perception of her. Maybe she doesn't care whether it appears realistic or not because all she cares about doing is her spy, scientist, vigilante, whatever the fuck job. Maybe she doesn't care whether it appears realistic or not because when she no longer wants the heels on, she can take them off to use them as daggers. Maybe she doesn't care because the men who fight alongside her wouldn't be brave enough to wear them. Thank you. Ah, thank you so much, Maya. I just, ah, I just love the way Maya performs. Any poem, but this poem in particular, so good. Um, and I just thank you for giving me permission to pop off. I love that. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for that poem. I just love it. Um, yeah, so I spent a lot of time with Maya's poem and the thing the thing that I just really loved with it about it is the repetition um, of maybe and then how the poem starts with she, she wants, she wants, she feels, she wants, and then it flips to she doesn't care. And I just love that, like the things she wants and the things that she doesn't care about. And, um, and I was just thinking about this. I feel like this poem's a lot about gender performance and um and so I just was thinking about gender performance. Um, and so that's where I went with this. And I actually wrote two different poems and this is the one I landed with. I, I think actually the first one I wrote was a little more popping off. So maybe I'll share that one with you later. <laughs> um, okay. so this is my response to Maya's poem in defense of wearing a binder at home in a pandemic. And I'm just gonna make a small attribution to Maya and also to the poet Taylor Johnson, who also has a poem um, that refers to the body as a boat and it's about transness too. So um, just a shout out to both of them. In defense of wearing a binder at home in a pandemic, maybe they want to feel sails tethered close to the body as velvet boat Maybe they want to tightly arrange in a column, knit this parcel of platooned bones in close to make way for air. Maybe they want a surprise mirror because gender performance finds audience in the echo self. Maybe they want the deep wine, red divots of rib constriction, the gathering of chest to build elasticity against misrecognition. Maybe they don't care how small the landscape of witness, baby, dog, partner, birds, rail cars, tree buds, neighbor cat, because beyond the gaze, visibility rumbles in their ab abdomen. Maybe they don't care whether it appeals, appears realistic or not because realness, a fiction in the enemy's perception. 
maybe they don't care whether it appears realistic or not because they are an exaggerated yawn. They are the small square in the lawn that soaks sun. Maybe they don't care whether it appears realistic or not because the disrobing moment at day's end becomes a relief, not a burden of extra flesh. Maybe they don't care because learning to wrap a tight bind in private and not on the flamboyant street is some kind of love letter. Thank you. Thank you, Maya, so much for this. Thank you. I'm go Listen, when I write an ode to my binder, I'm going to send it to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Whew. Hey, Lala. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, now I'm gonna read a poem. Um, it's, the form is called A Burning Sun. I'm having a difficult time hearing you, Jen. So someone needs to mute. That's what the, okay, there we go. Okay, thank you. Okay, can everyone hear me again? Someone said Jam's poem broke Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so this poem um, is a, a burning high bun, which is a, po uh, a form that's based on the high bun form, but it was um, created yeah. by the poet Torin A. Greathouse. Um, and a haiban is traditionally a prose poem followed by a haiku, and it comes from 17th century Japanese poetry. Um, the thing that Torin Greathouse added is rather than just making a prose poem and a haiku, um, you write a prose poem and then you erase it. You take out a bunch of words and then you erase it again and make a haiku. So it's just like reducing the text down to just taking words out and erasing them. So. Um, that's what this is, and it's called In the Warble Wall, a burning high bun after Torin A. Great House. I just want to shout out to my daughter, Sunny, and my partner. Sunny's getting ready for a bath in the next room, so you might hear her. <laughs> in the Warble Wall, a burning high bun. Just getting ready for a bath in the next room. Oh. Um, this morning, in dirty jogging clothes, I drag a reluctant dog into the cold sun of early spring. This morning, in the warble wall, a trilling buzz, I lash breasts tightly to body, compressed pillows. Listen in one ear to a poet, and in my other ear, the birds. The poet tells the story about sending a box of books across the world, and I cry. What I'm saying is that I languish in blunt desire without movement. Why I'm taking this deep dive into my shape and shaft and wondering how to find certainty. Looking back, I try to remember how I used to imagine myself and what I come up with is a well of embarrassed lust. How to pinpoint the beginning before the covering up. There comes a point when the skin rubs discomfort the only way to sit is to lean back so the flesh flap doesn't fold onto belly. There comes a point when the hair is too long and puffs at the sides. I don't want to be vague. When I face those dark scars, imagining arms on a tether, I feel fear. Reluctant dog in the warble wall, a trilling buzz, lash breast to body, in one ear, birds, a box, and I cry. Blunt desire. We know what happened. Oh, it just looks like they've frozen. Um, I don't know if they're gonna drop or if they'll come back. 
Mm. Mm. Well, I think I think Jan might actually drop. Yep. So <laughs> here I am. Well, it's up um, to you. Do you, do you want to wait? Do you want to wait? Because Jan will join again. Yeah. It's, do you think? Lala, what came up for you when you first got to read Jan's poem? Ooh. I think um, the vulnerability of it and um, some of the language, just like talking about scars and talking about fear um, and talking about, um, yeah, like, like desire and like this this way that we like cut ourselves off and just hold back and are embarrassed or ashamed. Um, yeah, it was really powerful for me and I was really excited to be able to write a response to it. It's a good question, thank you. <laughs> I saw someone while we're waiting for Jan to come back, I saw someone ask in the chat whether or not this was the first time that we're hearing the responses to the to the poems um trying to find the actual question does anyone want to take that even though you wouldn't be spotlit mary here uh mm -hmm. that this is going to be my first time hearing the responses i wanted to be shocked and awed, especially hearing the voices of those that created the original piece. So I'm very excited to hear the responses first time here. Yeah, I'll say that we, we mostly share our uh, poems via email. And so, um, and so, and, and some of us just today have been sharing the, our responses via email. And so, um, and so I know that the person who responded to my poem, this is the first time I, I read it, but I have not heard them read it. Um, and I will probably weep. Just saying. Yeah, same for me. I, I read um, Kate's response poem and when I read it I was just I was just sobbing I was a mess and I was like there's no way I'm going to hold it together when I hear Kate read this <laughs> um so I I was a mess then and I'm a mess now so hearing hearing poems in people's voices just makes it feel like a whole new poem so I felt like I was like experiencing Samara's poem for the first time even though I've read it so many times in order to write a response. I definitely gave there. I am wondering if Jan, are you back? I think that's you. Can you change your name so that um, Liz can find you and and spotlight you? I think that's you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, um, I had to join for my phone. Apologies, <laughs> my I'm internet gonna, crash. Okay, I'm gonna rename you because I, I thought that was you. And then, um, and then this should find you. Sorry for the technical difficulties. <laughs> You've been answering yeah. questions and dancing. We're doing great. <laughs> and look, someone and set is like cheering. I can see it. So you're back. <laughs> like, you know, conjured and summoned you. Here you are. Okay, am I up? I can't see anything because I'm on my phone. Okay, awesome. Should I start from the top with this poem? 
Um, maybe from the top yeah. of your haiku or the poem or the haiku. I don't know, whatever you feel. Yeah, I'll just read the last haiku. How about that? Okay, so it ends with in the warble wall, breast tight to body, I cry, face those dark scars, fear. Is it my turn? <laughs> um, thank you so much. I was, you weren't, I don't know if you heard me, but I was, I was talking about how I was inspired by the vulnerability of your poem and the rawness of your poem and um, just like the language about scars and about fear um, and about like, yeah, just desire. So my, my poem in response is called Unbound. Um, and I didn't do the same format, but I did an erasure. Like I did like prose and I did an erasure. Um, so Unbound. We bind ourselves in a myriad of ways. This flesh and skin can become a prison of promises made to everyone else but ourselves. This skeletal wall at times feels coziest when bound, lashed tightly to chest, this breast somehow breathes better this way, draws air more steadily into lung and listen. Do you hear the birds? They've shed their evolutionary tether and look how they soar, unbound. These promises become a shroud for telling the coming of our tightly wound death death by binding, death by promise. And where are these promise holders anyway? Where are they when we're rattling at our cage, longing to feel something that is ours, something that is like those birds, impulse and nature, desire seen, wanted and appeased, no in between. We bind ourselves. <laughs> become a prison, promise everyone, skeletal wall, feel lashed, better this way, listen. Do you hear evolution, unbound promises, foretell death by binding, and where, where is our something, impulse, nature, desire appeased? So beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you for your poem. <laughs> I appreciate you so much. I appreciate you. Uh, you know. <laughs> <sighs> I read again. Um, I, I know you looking at you. <laughs> um, this poem, it's been a time, you guys, fam, loves, people. Um, it has been a time, and the way that I have been getting through is to just write some really honest poetry about it. And so this poem um, may be triggering to some. Um, it's about lynchings um, and, and, and white violence. So. <sighs> Show me the difference between then and now. I suppose I should be grateful that the picnics have ended. No more bodies swaying from trees while white people sit at their feet, passing cold chicken and cucumber sandwiches or bread spread with preserves and served with cheese and honey, cheering and trading body pieces. An ear here, no, I want a toe. A toe? Give me an eye. Parents sigh as children shout with glee over the dead body, curved apart piece by piece while still swaying from a tree. Thank you for that, Law. Um, so, um, in my response to Lala's poem, I was really um, 
deeply struck by the by the la by the first line of the poem. Um, I suppose I should be grateful, and it's it's a line that stuck with me for a long time. Lala gave me this poem like weeks ago. I don't even remember. Um, and um, and I was so struck with it that I felt like the the my poem in response should end with that first line. And so what I wrote is a contrapuntal poem. I, I'll drop what that is in the chat. I'll drop it here, which is um, you take two separate poems and you merge them um, into one poem. But I started by flipping Lala's poem upside down um, because I really wanted to end with that with that that first line. And so as Lala's poem is about lynching, so is this poem about lynching. And, um, and Lala's poem immediately made me think of um, that song, Strange Fruit. Um, and so this, song, this poem is called Like Fruit Hanging Too Long, a contrapuntal poem in response to Lala. Show me the difference between then and now. Like Fruit Hanging Too Long. Like fruit hanging too long from a tree, not quite time to cut down yet. Still swaying, giving up the last tremors of life, waiting to be ripped apart piece by piece with glee. Down below, mouths jagged and twisted, children shout over the dead body, fingers pointed up at the bloated horror. As parents sigh, give me an eye, I want a toe. A toe? No, an ear. A postcard scene on a Saturday night here, trading body pieces. Like fruit hanging too long that is soft to the touch, a splash of color on white bread spread with preserves and served with cheese and honey or whatever sweetness is needed to mask the heavy scent of scorched flesh mingled in with cucumber sandwiches and cold chicken at their feet, idle conversation at their lips. White people passing whole handfuls of dark meat pulling away from bones while bodies sway from trees silently syncopated with the midsummer breeze and the pulley tension conducting a soundless orchestra until the vibration stops, until it is no more. The picnics have ended with rain and with time the blood has been washed away from these old roots. I suppose I should be grateful. Thank you for your poem, Lala. Thank you for that. I, I appreciate you. I love you so much. I love you. what you did. I'm, I was hoping, I knew, I just knew I could trust you. And it's just amazing. I love you so much. Mm. Thank you, fam. Oh, sass. Um, all right, all right, all right. We just keep moving on. I'm like 60% robot and I don't, you know, I've been like weeping and that's a thing that I don't tend to do very much, but I have been weeping um, from jump actually, from jump, Samara's poem, from jump. Um, so this poem is called um, A Mercy Road. And um, uh, this month for lots of Muslims are that we're observing Ramadan, which is the month in which we fast. And it is a month of abundant mercy. Um, and some, um, some Muslims like to spend the month doing many things that are, you know, that feel observant. And one of those things is, um, is reflecting on the 99 names of God, 99 names of Allah and his, um, and the, one of the first names is uh, the most merciful. And so I, as a, I was thinking about that idea, the most merciful, and this idea that um, we're in this time where mercy is in abundance and, um, and just thinking about sometimes how difficult it is for, for, for me to be able to extend that same, that same gift to myself. So um, this poem is called A Mercy Road. When I think of mercy as a long and wide road that stretches from here into the horizon, I let my mind rest on the gift of starting again, knowing that the thinnest light on the horizon will swell and illuminate the whole of the road, despite how alone the night. 
I like a mercy road that is long and wide and deeply etched. It feels formidable of substance, a noun. We can point to it with our index fingers. That's how we know it is a place. Can you imagine passing me as I've stopped on the road or maybe an earlier version of myself, a stranger to you, that detail doesn't matter. Imagine you call out to this version of myself sitting on the side of the road to ask why I have stopped. I am lost, I might reply. I cannot find the path. I imagine you spreading your arms wide, framing the whole illuminated breath of it, saying this, this is it. You are on the right path, El Sorato Mustaqim. I imagine myself shaking my head as I, gaze, as I gaze down at my root sprouted feet. I am lost, I cannot find the way. So you take your leave, what else is there to do? A root can be a fixed thing. When I think of mercy as a long and wide road, I think of the mountains turning to dust, ash settling on the shoulders of every version of myself rooted in like mile markers. In all of the vastness of this mercy road, I've never been able to find the curve that bends it back towards me. A mercy road is a benison, and I am always without a mirror. This, um, I love you. <laughs> this poem came to me after weeks of not functioning. I am a mentally ill human being. Um, somebody who has a very hard time showing mercy to myself. And this came to me in a moment that a good friend of mine uh, who's also a therapist had recommended that I write to my little, my younger me, who I've never shown mercy to. Um, and uh, for those here who don't know me, uh, I got pregnant with my first child when I was 16 and I've been on my own in the world since that age. Um, and so this, <laughs> This came in in a moment uh, of just <laughs> inability to um, see myself as human and uh, reminded me that I want to. Um, and so uh, I finished it five minutes before we got onto this call because it took me weeks to be able to respond. I actually, my organic response to it was this little bite-sized poem about how I hadn't brushed my hair. Um, and I have imposter syndrome, so I didn't want to respond to it because it's a whole world. <laughs> um, but I decided, fuck it, I have this other little one, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> and if it doesn't work out, I'll read the little one. Um, but I finished it five minutes before, so I have not practiced reading it. So let's see how it goes. Um, it is called When I Get Moving on That Mercy Road. When I get moving on that mercy road, wide and stretched and being a noun, my heart buoys backward to the baby me I was before I became a mother and especially the baby me I was when I became a mother. I remember my eyes scanning for mercy on that road, long and bare, lined with the ash from the parts of the baby me that scorched to the earth in the birth behind me. My eyes searching seeking, begging, beseeching, imploring a mercy for a mom with no mom. The souls wearing thin because there's a lot of walking involved with having no home, especially when you're a baby's mother as 
a baby mother with the type of mother who doesn't know mercy. The calluses grow while the heart grows weak and the babies cry curling around the ear after baby is told, maybe later, mommy needs to work. Thicken that mercy callus and not just around the souls. But as I keep myself stationed on that mercy road, etched in formidable and being a noun, I too look for the curve, wanting still to bend it back toward baby me. And though the wanting and the getting are two different things, I know that I wear different shoes today with durable soles and pointy cleats. Souls washed with tears I let flow, cascading with the might of a river with a right to feel the strength of its current. And so I aim toward this blessing of a mercy road. And I imagine seeing baby me, perhaps now a stranger, not that this detail matters. Resting on the gift of what sprouted roots can do. And I see my mighty branches making the shade that will become my mercy, long and wide and stretched, washed clean by the might of a river, deeply etched and formidable, a noun. Hot damn. <laughs> I love you. Thank you. That was a gift. And maybe I'll brush my hair tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Jen. Um, and now I have to turn to this one, which is a little different. <laughs> um, so a uh, couple things. So first, there are people here who are probably part of my social media. And so they know the complicated relationship that I have with targeted ads. Um, <laughs> Uh, for some reason, Facebook thinks that I want art pieces of people swimming in bowls of macaroni and socks that say farts and cologne that is funeral home scented. Um, <laughs> so uh, in keeping with the theme tonight of uh, transformation and healing, um, I decided to choose a poem that I wrote to a sponsored weight loss ad. Um, as I mentioned, I was, I've been on my own since I was 16. I grew up very poor and had failure to thrive into my 20s. I had very thin hair. I was just super underweight. Um, and so I have a particular feeling about sponsored weight loss ads. Um, and so here is my other piece. It is called Dear Sponsored Weight Loss Ads. My fatness fats in ways that jiggle joy. Every curve holding the weight of all my wonder and all my work. Voluptuous virtue, solid, unwavered, taking up space, being beautiful, clad, or in lace. I am me, no apology. So please feel free to fuck off. The end. I got to respond to Sass's poem. Um, I love this poem. Um, I love being fat. And I was really excited to write a response. Um, this poem has, um, I tried to use some of the words that Sass used, but I also um, took a lot of inspiration and, and concepts from the book Undrowned, 
uh, by Alexis Pauline Gums. I'm obsessed with that book right now. So there's some of some inspiration of that in here. Um, my fatness fats, fat and unfashionable, fat and unnameable, queer, crazy, fat. My fat jiggles joyously. My fat works wondrously. Bearded behemoth. My fat doesn't take up space. She echolocates, dives deep, nameless and formless, evading your grasp, refusing comprehension. Why do you always need me to be the bigger person? You hate me because you fear the ways I make you wonder, the way I spill over into all the boxes you call beautiful. My reach so long, so large, I stretch voluptuous through time and space. You come to hunt me, the mystery of me, she swallows you whole. Love that. <laughs> so now I read my poem. Um, this poem is called Joppa Flats. Um, it's about a place with that name um, in or near Newburyport, Massachusetts. And it's a significant Same. place for my family and a significant place for me. Um, in a hard way. And so I found out that it is also now an Autob Audubon sanctuary and going there and thinking about birds as symbols helped me to, um, you know, kind of say the things that I need to say, but in an obscure way or to guess at things from stories that I didn't quite know um, the actual detail. It starts with me and it goes through different people in my family. Jennifer, I go back there, a seawall, a mud flat, expanse of blue sky, clear day, marsh grass rolls in the wind, a constant wave never crashing. A scarlet tanager lands on a cattail, considering me. Binoculars around my neck, heavy like the weight of a body on my chest. No, just heavy. I lift them to my eyes, turn the dial to focus in, breathe. My eyes, the color of sand and sunlight, considering blue sky, marsh grass, wave crash, cattail, that tanager, its body a fireball in the wind, the feeling of being on fire, my hands pinned to the wet earth like the wings of a taxidermied bird to a driftwood panel. No, come back. Blue gross beak, magnolia warbler, seaside sparrow, yellow breasted chat, least tern, laughing gull, kill deer, green heron, birds as beautiful as their names. I am here not just again, but like for the first time, the sun warm on my bare arms, the taste of salt in the air, the wind tousling my hair and my memory, blowing some of that hurt out to sea. I am here now, my hands my own. Manya, Bromfield Street, a sky blue house, a store with a soda fountain and a counter where my mother sat, legs swinging, chatting to you each day after school. You were her rock, her protector. I wonder if you hold me today, if you held me that day. I wonder where you brought your pain. Did you ever walk alone to this spot, look out at this same estuary, Watch for a flash of hope in a red bird, a red blood stain, a wide red sail. You were 16, the same age I was on that day, alone. They were supposed to follow you, sisters, a wedding, a letter, alone. How did you move through the heavy weight of that hurt, the grief pulling you under a constant wave? Dark-eyed Junko, Cedar waxwing, sooty shearwater, osprey, eastern Phoebe. Are you here 
the sun a ghost, salt on my skin an armor, I reach for you. Cecilia, communion, your sanctuary, blood of my blood, flesh of my flesh, a stain on the altar cloth, the smell of incense, his sweat, a bird in the rafters, partridge, goldfinch, morning dove. I look out over the water and pray for you, a bird on the waves, parasitic Jaeger, a bird on the wind, a blackbird, no, a raven. Melissa, ruddy turnstone, brant, great cormorant, bufflehead, plover, fallow rope, you are steady, ballast, breath, marsh grass, cattail, sister, you and I, a wide red sail, ashore. Melody, the most popular girl at Newburyport High School, class president, honor roll, how did you cover your pain so skillfully? Even now the details a choppy sea. The night he hit her so hard her jaw broke, you between them pleading, him laughing, threatening you with the glowing end of his cigarette. The sunset here is fire. Melody, lark sparrow, house finch. You married a man who hated you but never hit you. King rail, glossy ibis. You left him and showed us the way forward. Kestrel, broad winged hawk. When my life is a crashing wave, your love is open wings. In flight, the sky expands. Rose. We didn't know you passed until months later. Our family an archipelago, my memory a sheer water, diving at the water between these scattered islands trying to stay alive. I want to sit close to you again, to go home. I am a pelagic bird, you are the wind. Thank you for listening. That was beautiful. Thank you so much um, for that, Jen. Um, yeah, when I when I read your poem, I was amazed at all of the the how you weaved in the story of your family into the nature of I guess of like the place that's now in Audubon. It, it, it was so fascinating, and I'm new to to Maine, so all the the birds and the the names like of the of nature it was very new to me and I was like wow um, but also the pain like weaving that into the beauty of nature and yet the pain so um, the poem that I created um, I decided to sort of look at the nature around me the ones that I knew the names of or that I've seen and put that into this with a, a pain that I was also feeling concerning my life um, so and I the, the way that you titled um, your poems like underneath with like the name of the person and then like the year as well. It, um, I decided to sort of do that uh, with the the name of, you know, a creature that I felt feel like um, um, as well as the year that I arrived to Maine. So I will begin. I feel a little nervous, just FYI, vulnerability. <laughs> I'm like shaking. Alrighty. Um, you got this spirit. poem. Yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> All right, so Sparrow, 2018. New to this mainland, I feel silenced and unseen. Newness leading to an immediate sense of loneliness. Unknown to where to go or whom to seek. Noticing that those who are bright in conversation immediately catch everyone's eyes and thus ears. Cardinals, Baltimore Orioles, even those with just a pinch of colorful surprise catch sights and chances for new adventures, red-winged blackbirds. But I, camouflaged in anonymity, some brown bird over there, is hidden easily amongst the barks and shadows of the lands around me. And I, as I am, have no attractive tune to sing out a call for connection. <sighs> it's 
So yeah. Alrighty. So now I shall continue. <laughs> As um, so, this next poem, um, it <laughs> I, I put the year when I write these poems, and this one um, was written uh, March 11, 2020. And we know how March 2020 was. So, um, and it was before like the, the parallelogram, as Maya so put, <laughs> um, it was before all of that hit. And um, not only was that about to hit before I wrote this poem, but also I was about to find out that for the fourth year in a row, I did not get a job I was trying to get. So this is a poem I, I wrote for, for me. Congrats me, that's the title, congrats me. So congrats, you did it. You woke up this morning. You've chosen to keep going. Congrats, you're here. Though the tears may fall, you haven't given up on all. Congrats, you're worthy, just as you are. No matter how near or far from your goal, you are loved. Congrats, my beloved. I love it. Thank you, Mary, for sharing with us. Thank you so much for giving me a chance to respond to your amazing poetry. I love that poem. I love both of your poems that you shared. That first one, I, yeah, that, that was really, that was amazing. They were both amazing, but I had not read that first one so that I was experiencing it for the first time. So it was lovely, thank you. Um, I wrote a response poem to Mary's poem and this is called Perfectly Being. And um, there are some pine trees nearby and there have been pine trees in my life for most of my life. And I just find them to be amazing. And sometimes a little bit frightening, but mostly just amazing. And so jumping off what Miri said, this is the poem that I wrote. Look at the pine trees. They neither spin nor toil, but Lord how they grow. Slowly, imperceptibly, day in and day out, breathing unconsciously, even maybe being forgotten, but remaining unconsciously gaining breadth and depth and height until the passer, passers-by must roll their heads to their shoulder blades to witness the full majesty. And watch how they dance when the wind blows their boughs and pulls at their massive trunks recklessly, dangerously, maybe, or maybe just so perfectly that the only movement, that only the movement and the pine tree can be accounted for. There's a lesson here, I think. I think I see it now when I behold the breadth and depth and height of you with your shoulders squared and your eyes unfaltering and your laughter dancing recklessly. And so congratulations, my beloved, on perfectly being. Yes, 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 yes. With the words and the feelings and the tears and whatnot, yes. Oh, I love how we ended that. I feel like we just went on a, on a trip, on a trip. Everyone's here, everyone's here, yes. Um, I'm allergic to pine trees, so I was imagining a different tree. <laughs> they make me. <laughs> uncomfortable. Um, thank you all. It was so beautiful to hear all of our original pieces and then the responses. That was just beautiful and vulnerable and fierce and all that, all that shit. So thank you. Um, 
Thank you for hanging with us, folks. And we are loving your gratitudes in the chat. So keep that up and please drop any questions. Um, so before we get into um, the Q&A period, whatever that's gonna look like, it'll be a surprise. I don't know what questions you're thinking about. Um, we are gonna read this collaborative poem that we wrote together. And so um, there are many different ways to write a collaborative poem. Um, with this poem, we had one person start out and the person who started um, this round is Miri. Is Miri. And, then, um, and then we just played like a game of telephone where we sent a part of our response to, every, to the next person in line. And we constructed the poem that way. Um, and so you get to hear all of our voices. And I'm going to um, pass it to, to Miri, who's going to start us off. Maybe we should all come off mute, actually, so that there's not an awkward, I just realized that there's not an awkward silence. <laughs> Can, can you hear me okay? We can hear you okay. Woohoo! All right. All right. So, starting it off. So, the title of this poem is We Are a Slick, Sparkling Miracle. The sun peeks through the window curtains, nudging me to move my leaden limbs. I wake from a dream where I am a dolphin, swimming alongside my friends, clicking, swimming, diving, leaping, knowing. We are a wave, a slick, sparkling miracle. With the might to capsize or cleanse, choosing the crash or choosing the ebb, protective pearls can fashion within. So do both the crash and the ebb, and let the bones fall where they may. We can create pearls from our sorrow, whittle bones into precious, sacred things. Furnish the femur with water, collect what's left in the tub and douse elbows, greet agony with sodden marrow. Adorn yourself within the crash and ebb, Breathe and embrace the complexities outside and in. Protect what is precious. Let fall what needs releasing. Holding on to nothing but the pulse, the roaring and the movement of perpetual transformation. Hey. <laughs> I love us. We are fantastic humans. Thank you all so much for your poems and thank you all for listening um now we're gonna go through our q and a and as a reminder uh just to respect everyone's time we'll stop at 7 30 uh so we apologize in, in advance if we aren't able to get to everybody's questions um you can and you can insert your questions in the chat if you'd rather like have your question private uh that's totally understandable so just be sure to message um either the MHC staff or, or myself privately, if you'd rather keep your question private. Um, please forgive me if I mispronounce your name for whatever reason. Don't tell me it's not a big deal because it's your name and it's a really huge deal. And, and also um, sometimes Gmail does this thing where like it shows your, your dead name at times. Um, but please, please don't tell me it's not a big deal for, for dead naming you. I want to make that particularly clear. Um, I'm going to search for some questions. Um, that you're more than welcome to put in the chat. We're very excited to answer your questions. Thank you all again for choosing a day where on Facebook Live and Zoom to continue on Zoom because Zoom fatigue is real. Um, oh my goodness, we have a question from Harple. Uh, please tell us how this got started and how we found each other. <laughs> uh, I'll start. Um, this started uh, a year ago, well, um, a year ago on the first. Um, I wanted to do a thing 
for National Poetry Month. And so I happen to be in community with some really rad, brilliant writers and poets and people. And so, um, yeah, we just was like, hey, do you want to do this thing? And they were like, yes. And the group has fluctuated a little bit. Um, we've shifted a bit over time um, and added more wonderful, magical people. But honestly, how we found each other, I think most of us are just kind of in community <laughs> with each other. Um, we work with each other and we're friends with each other and just kind of are, I don't know if anyone else has anything else to say. I'll just say that I've come to know some folks in this group through being in this group together. So I knew maybe people's names or their faces, but didn't know much about them. And now I feel like we know some very particular things about each other and it's really beautiful. Hello, Mary here. So yeah, for me, I, I happen to state that, oh yeah, I, I write poetry, yeah. I'll, I'll, you know, I do some poems here and there. And then Sama was like, yes. <laughs> and then I was like, ooh -wee. So I got to join this amazing community because I stated one of my hobbies and I'm so, I did not know it existed. You know, I was that new kid on the block, like not knowing where to go. And I'm just so, so grateful <laughs> to have met y'all and been a part of this. Heck yeah. We have a question that asks us, do you write as self-care or do you find yourself needing to care for yourself more after writing? I like this question. Um, I'll say for myself, I think um, that writing is a way for me to process um, a lot of different things. So it can be very therapeutic processing trauma through writing. But it's also, I think, just a way that I comprehend a lot of what's going on. I'm, I'm not always sure what I'm thinking or feeling until I write it down. So it's just, it's a way of processing and a way of being for me. It's a combination. Oh, you go first. No, you go first. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was going to say it's a combination of both of those things for me, and it's interesting. I'd be able to answer this question easier tomorrow, um, because though I do have a huge propensity for being long-winded, I am very afraid of being vulnerable, so my poems are always like little bite sizes, um, and so I usually feel better after I do them. Boop. Okay, look, I did it. Uh, and also I'm part of this amazing community, which I was brought into by Sama, and I have massive imposter syndrome. I cannot, y'all are just like amazing friggin' writers. And so what I read to you all tonight is the longest thing I have written in a number of years. Uh, and so I'll know whether or not it was really therapeutic tomorrow. I think so. I love that question set. I think for me, it depends on what I'm writing um, because believe it or not, this is, I don't, sharing poetry is very vulnerable to me. This is like, I've been, been like really committed since 2017, returning to poetry and being vulnerable and sharing. And so, um, and so sometimes if I'm in a practice, I can just sit down and I can write a thing. Like I always have things in my head. Um, but I find that if I'm writing something that's particularly vulnerable, this happened a lot last year, several times last year where it's like a poem that just is really is touching on something that is you know and sitting in trauma or in some sort of wound then it takes me a long time to get it out and then afterwards I'm exhausted for like days um and I both enjoy it and absolutely hate it but usually it's something good and powerful maybe usually <laughs> I'll definitely agree with with Sama. Absolutely, it really depends on the poem. And I know that there have been some times where where it's like, "Ooh, I wrote this poem. Like, this is like ser seriously like super duper new, and I need to share it." Or sometimes it's a poem that like I've been working on during my time in grad school, or working on for something else, and it's like. And, and I've distanced myself for a while because of like how draining it was to write and then I'd share it with folks and then I'd get feedback that way for sure. Any other 
questions that folks have? I saw way back, I think it was Stephen ask a question if there's going to be a way to find these response poems in a collection. And I'm just like repeating that question. I would love that personally. We'd 100% down for that. <laughs> yeah. So now we just have to figure out how to do it. Yes. I mean, I feel a little put on the spot like that, but okay. Yes. I mean, yes, absolutely. But I don't know. <laughs> we'll get back to you, Stephen. Yes. PBD. Oh, Steph asked the question. Oh my, I don't want to take your job. I just saw it came, I just saw it fall by. Uh, Steph wanted to know, where did it go? Oh, what poet is currently inspiring you? Who are you reading? Who are you reading? I'm not reading a lot of poems right now, except the poems in this group. And that is like so much richness that I don't, I'm not reaching for books on my shelf of poems, but I'm reading a lot. I'm rereading Octavia Butler's works right now. And so there's something about all the stuff that's hard about the world we're in and also what's possible on the new suns that it is like resonating in me a lot right now. I'm currently reading uh, Wanda Coleman's work and reading her collection of essays right now. Um, and after that, I'm really excited to read uh, Ada Limon's uh, most recent book. Super duper excited for that. Um, and, but before I read those, I read uh, um, Elizabeth Acevedo's uh, most recent book and, and, I, and I loved it. Um, and it's a, uh, it's a book for teens that's prose poetry and, and it's gorgeous. Um, I just finished that book too, Maya. So good. Um, I literally the other night I finished it. Um, I, yeah, just uh, two days ago, I just read a ton of um, Taylor Johnson's work, which they're just a, an amazing poet. And I've um, really been into the poet Alexandria Phillips as well this year. Um, really amazing poet. And um, I just got the new collection by the Telling Room, A New Land, and I'm just digging into it. Highly recommend it. That cover feels so nice in your hand. I haven't, this is me feeling the cover right now. It feels so nice in your hand. I haven't opened it yet, but um, I am, uh, I, I am, I bought, Jericho Brown's The Tradition, like, I don't know, whenever. And um, I had, like, I like just last week, I was looking for something to soothe me. And I was like, let me go to there. So I guess that's the, that's what I, that's the poetry that I'm looking, that I'm reading right now. And everything in this group. been reading Samaz Chap book and everything in this group I like usually read three times in a row <laughs> which keeps me busy because I like let my email pile up and then I'm having to read days <laughs> a million times because uh, I can't help myself so that's a beautiful thing. There is a question about um, uh, will we perform together again, like go on tour around the state when things open up again? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get a van. <laughs> Let us know. Uh, oh, Jeff, look at a van. Oh, can we spray paint the van? Yes. 
Listen, as if, as long as we get paid well, I'm definitely open to this. <laughs> mm, just get an RV. Anyway, okay. There are probably other questions. Oh, ooh, this, uh, okay. I think this will be our last question. I think depending on time, when did you start writing? If you started writing and took a break, what brought you back? I like that question too. Hey, Mary here. So I was writing a lot of poetry in fourth grade, like when I was super young. And then when adulthood happened and like I was going into a totally different career, I thought I was supposed to suppress all my art form and like <laughs> be this robot that like didn't do art. And so recently, like my therapist and other people, they're like, yo, you can still do art stuff. Like it's actually like, medicine like you need it to, to live <laughs> and I was like yes tis true my, my my inner child and my spirit was like yeah so I started like like now like in my like, late 20s 30s like started getting back into the art and it's been so healing for me it's medicine period you know so that's how I'm I'm back in it <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I have, I similarly started writing poetry quite young. And I think that actually most kids write poetry even before they can figure out how to physically write. Like that's just in their body and who we are as people is this um, oral storytelling and this rhythmic like musical medicine that we pass on to each other. And um, so as a child, I latched on to that like most children do. And then I just never, ever let it go. <laughs> and so, and so um, yeah, sometimes I might not love what I'm writing, but I'm almost always writing something, even if it's just for me. I was really young when I started. I actually still remember my first poem. It was, I like fish on a blue tasty dish. Um, <laughs> that's good fish. <laughs> and uh, I, I wrote incessantly up until I moved to Maine, which was about 15 years ago, um, when my life began to stop being quite as difficult as it had been for the first 30 years. And I had a hard time writing about contentness. And then my youngest child moved out almost simultaneously with me finally making this living wage and all the shit came back and I started writing again. <laughs> this is, I wrote when I was, yeah, I wrote when I was young, I used to write poetry, short stories. I had a, an English teacher who looked like Sandy Duncan. I don't know if anybody remembers Sandy Duncan. Anyway. Um, who encouraged me to write and I did well. Um, and, and, you know, she encouraged me to enter contests, regional contests and all this, and I did well. And then something happened, like a, I got some sort of, you know, young and vulnerable, got some sort of criticism that did not feel good. And so I stopped sharing my poetry. And then I went to grad school and I, I just, like, like, Mary, I was like, oh, I don't know what, I stopped being able to write creatively in that kind of way um, for many, many years. And then, um, and then I went, and th so my, my return to poetry has been recent. Um, I was inspired to write by a weird animal that I saw when I was visiting New Mexico, and then a poem just popped into my head fully formed. And I was like, oh, shit, look at that. And then I, then I just decided that this was um, like, I just need to push myself to do, to like connect with people through poetry. It's just, so that's why, that's why I returned to it. Um, an oryx, Aaron Athwit animals, an oryx. Yes, oryx. Um, I started writing when I was a kid as well. Um, my grandmother was a poet and I'm the youngest. And I think honestly, really, truly that she was just trying to give me a task because I was always like underfoot. Um, and so I started writing poetry um, and I, I, I never really shared it with anyone until um, like a few years ago, I was just kind of like writing a blog like for myself, just like kind of a healing practice. Um, and then, yeah. 
I started to get a little bit more brave um, and and stepped into the world of, of poetry community. So. And then they were named best poet of the year in 2018 by the Phoenix, you know, su super casual is whatever. And I want to, I want to read what Kate said earlier in the, I love you too. I want to read what Kate said in the chat. The invitation to this group brought me back to writing and I love that. Thank you so much, Kate, for sharing that. And. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, um, I've been writing forever too, off and on and didn't write for a long time after grad school felt sort of stuck and um yeah it's really the the practice and community of this group that has brought me back to writing and i'm so grateful for the just the way to receive everyone's words as offerings in this group and to feel held and accountable to each other in that way it's been so crucial to me this year in so many ways and it's really brought me back into a writing practice that is the best writing practice I've ever had. So it's really this group. So I just want to say that. I've been writing since I was eight years old, but it wasn't until I moved to Maine where I got the chance to find writing community outside of like slam poetry circles. Uh, so I want to thank all of you lovely humans for having space for me for that and how we all get to have space for each other in regards to that and it's been really nice how like one of the many reasons why I stay in Maine is because of like the artistic communities I've been able to be involved in and just thank you all so much for that and I know it's 7:33, so thank you all so so much thank you to the Maine Communities, uh, Maine Communities Council for having us and I hope you all rest well and drink water and take great care of yourselves and thank you thanks everyone Thank you Thank all. You. Love y'all. Bye. You. Bye. Thank you. Good night.